Good morning. Um, yeah, it's an interesting morning for me. This is the first time that Andrew's done worship leading and I've preached and we've managed to change over there pretty well. So that worked all right. Um, no, that's out of the way. I feel nice and relaxed, which is good. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm the Young Adults Pastor here at Campbell Baptist Church and I'm continuing our series on mission. Um, and I've been really encouraged by the service today, just thinking about all the different ways that people have played a part in the service uh, reminds me of you know, the body of Christ working together so well. That's going to be a theme of what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning. Um, when I saw the title, On Mission with Friends, I thought that um, maybe this sermon should be about how do we share our faith with our friends? Like, what are some tips or what are some ideas? Um, I remember as a young man hearing talks like that, and as the things were introduced, I remember hearing the person running the session describe something in a really great way, and I'd furiously try and write it down, and then they'd say something else, and I'd try and write that down, and maybe I wouldn't write it fast enough, and I'd feel like, oh, I don't know if I could ever do it as well as the person running the session can do it. Um, and so I found that it actually made me worry more to get some tips and training in the area. It made me feel more inadequate. Um, but something I discovered when I was at uni uh, around a similar time was that I didn't have to share faith in a vacuum. It wasn't just me being the one person that was sharing with friends. Um, it could be something I did collectively with a group of people. Uh, we started this um, sports ministry at uni where we had a group of people uh, that were Christian joining with some other people who just wanted to play. And we did mixed netball and I had never played mixed netball before. Um, I managed to break every rule in my first game and was, the whistle was going again and again and again. <laughs> Apparently, you can't do extra steps. You can't sort of leap and jump into people. Lots of things I didn't understand about netball. Um, but through that space, it was quite interesting because I was able to uh, share a little bit with some of the uh, people on the team. And I remember one day, um, I talked about having a relationship with God. And this uh, girl on the team asked me, well, what does that mean? And I'd never been asked that question before. And I sort of came up with something, but afterwards felt like oh, I didn't explain that very well. I think she actually was more confused after that conversation. Um, and shortly after that, uh, I heard from another friend in the team uh, that she'd asked them. She said, Joel told me about this relationship with God thing, but I didn't really get it. Can you help me understand it? And I found that really uh, a little embarrassing, but also encouraging. I felt relieved. Uh, there was someone else to speak into that space. It wasn't just me by myself. Um, and I think as I look at the way that uh, the gospel spread throughout the early world, um, early church, sorry. I see groups of people moving. I see apostles moving in little groups. Um, even when Jesus sends out the 72 disciples, he sends them out in pairs. There's an aspect of going together um, that I think we need to recapture in the church. But I want to be honest, working with other people can be tricky sometimes. Um, I remember in school, I would always dread the assignment where they'd say, you know, you're in a group of four, you're in a group of four, and and I have that sense of, oh, how are we going to do this? Because we all have different personalities. Some people leave things to the last minute. Some people just kind of forget to do the whole work at all, and you're left kind of carrying their part as well. And you all got the same grade, and I always thought that was very unfair. Um, but as I've grown up, I've discovered that actually working together as a team is part of life. Um, every job I've had, I've had to do that uh, with all kinds of different sorts of people. And sometimes the job is working together. That's part of the job. And that we don't all have the same skills. I think that's evident in our service today. We see different people with different abilities being able to do their part. Um, and we can't do all the parts ourselves. And I think it's the same with our faith. Uh, we need each other. And as we go on mission, we need each other again. And very occasionally, you might come up against something that you think, I can't actually do this by myself. And I think this is true of me with personal evangelism. So I say personal evangelism, meaning... I know someone and I want to share my faith with them. I find that I get quite stressed about it and I put a lot of pressure on myself. But if I invite other people into that space, I feel like, okay, this is more possible. Um, God is working through all of us and his spirit is guiding us as well. But I think if I put up my, a lot of pressure on just doing it by myself, then I might not be able to. Um, something, uh, I've got a little title for this sermon, uh, On Mission Together. So I've changed it up slightly. Nathan gave me the green light to do that though. <laughs> um, and I want to tell you a short story of when I really had to rely on other people to do something. Um, I'll show you a place in Tasmania called Cradle Mountain. Now, some of you may have been there. 
It's amazing. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my whole life. And um, I've been there two times. The first time I went there with my brother, and he had twin boys. And they were very active little boys. And we weren't sure, because they had all these different walks you could do, we weren't sure how they were going to go. But my brother was prepared. He brought these little backpack things, and I put one of my little nephews in the back, and 10 minutes in, he was asleep. (laughs) So I walked for about two hours with him just having a nap on my back. Um, And that was pretty tiring, but there were a whole lot of other walks I could do. And the second time I went there, I went there with my wife's family, and we decided to go a bit more hardcore. Uh, You can do these hikes up the mountain, up Cradle Mountain. And after about three hours, you should reach this large plateau. And so a lot of people, you know, try and do that because three hours up, three hours back, that's quite a big day already. Um, So we made a plan to try and go to the plateau. About an hour and a half in, we realised that hiking uh, up a mountain is very, very tiring. We started the day with jumpers and jackets and bags and things, and we got pretty hot and exhausted very quickly. On the next uh, slide, this is us just having a little break. Um, You know, our hair is a bit frazzled, uh, we're a bit tired now, but we're still enthusiastic at this point of the journey. Um, So we go on a bit further and we make it up um, to the plateau. So here, here we are, and we found a whole lot of snow, which was amazing, and we were throwing it in the air, making... Um, kind of little snowmen and things. Um, in the bottom left uh, corner, it's me throwing a, a snowball at my father-in-law, which is a risky thing to do. Uh, but he took it well and, and got me back a few times. Um, so that was when we were all very happy. We were a bit tired. Uh, and we heard that just a little bit further, another half hour, we would find this place called the Kitchen Hut. So this is the Kitchen Hut. Um, essentially, it's kind of a refuge place. Uh, and it's a very barren landscape. So um, I've been told when it's a windy day, they actually advise people not to climb up very high on the mountain because it's pretty oppressive conditions. And when it's wet, it gets very, very cold. So this is a popular place for people to shelter after walking for three hours. Um, it felt like just an interesting place for us to look into, but we were pretty tired too, so we, we had a sit. Um, and we read this sign at that point that forced us into a decision. So we could actually climb to the summit of the mountain if we were willing to go another hour and a half up the mountain. And this type of trek involved boulders. It's called it, it said, um, this is a bouldering section. So I didn't know exactly what that was, but I was maybe a bit young and naive and thought, yeah, let's do it. And um, a few of us were keen. Not everyone in the group wanted to do it. Uh, but Ange did, and I wasn't going to be held back if she was doing it. So uh, we did it together uh, with a few others in the family, and we started climbing the mountain. Um, And that decision to try and get to the very top was something that I probably regret, but I also think that it was amazing. Uh, It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. It was very, very challenging, and it was very, very scary. Um, After we completed the whole journey, I discovered that for a lot of the year, they close the summit. They don't let people climb because it's too dangerous. Um, And I discovered that out the hard way. Uh, What we discovered was the boulders were uh, about up to my shoulder, and you couldn't progress unless you climbed that sort of height. So we had to boost each other up uh, to get up sections of it. Um, and there were sections with uh, loose rocks. And as you're walking, you feel like you're actually going to slip and slide off one of these little boulder drops. So you're holding hands and you're moving very slowly and carefully. Um, and we actually got to a point about half an hour from the very top. We were really exhausted and really tired. And I'll show you a picture of Ange and I. This is our pretend version of being at the very top. Uh, we're not actually at the very top in that photo. Um, there was a, a, a tiny bit more, but, uh, but Ange said, you know, I think I'm done here, but I want you to keep going. So just three of us continued the last section, um, pulling each other up and helping each other across, and we did get to the very summit. Um, and something I, I found encouraging about that situation was I couldn't have done it by myself. I needed the other people around me to do it. And I think as we consider going on mission for God, we need to think about how much do we work together? Um, do we value each other in that way where we see that we're actually in this together? Um, let me pray for us as we continue. Father God, uh, thank you for this space that we can look into your word. I pray that your, your words would speak through me, uh, that your scripture would speak to us, and your Holy Spirit would reveal uh, what's true and helpful um, as we consider going on mission together. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, where our passage sits today, Mark chapter 2, um, just to catch you up on chapter 1, Jesus has just started his ministry. He's gathered a few disciples, not all of them, and he's just been driven out of his hometown of Nazareth, where he grew up. Uh, a huge mob has, has booted him out. 
and he arrives in Capernaum. And he doesn't go uh, into this section, into this place in a quiet kind of way. He goes straight to the synagogue, he starts teaching. So the first day in, crowds start gathering around. They're really interested in what he's saying. And it says at night, um, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. So it's a pretty big first day for Jesus in Capernaum. Um, and I think it's such a huge first day, and I, I find it fascinating. The next morning, Jesus kind of sneaks off and spends some time alone in prayer. And in that space, he decides, well, he's not going to stay where all the crowds are. He wants to go to where all the villages are. And he comes back, and the disciples say, where were you? You know, everyone's looking for you. And Jesus says, I need to go to these villages. So that's where I'm going to go. So he goes out there. But it says that everyone came from everywhere and found him in the villages. It's like this mob mentality. They just keep um, hunting him down. And it says, uh, because of all this, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. But the people still came to him from everywhere. So this crowding aspect um, is what we discover in our story, where uh, these men can't get to Jesus. And I have a few questions I want us to consider as we um, move forward. The first is, Jesus responds to the faith of this group by granting forgiveness of sins and healing. But what was so significant about their faith? The second, what does Jesus reveal about himself to not just this group, but the whole crowd? And what can we learn from the faith of these men and apply in our own lives? So we're going to jump into the passage of Mark chapter 2. If you have a Bible nearby, you might like to have it in front of you. I'm going to show a few verses on the screen, um, but it might be helpful to see the other verses in context as well. But let's start from chapter 2, verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers, there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. So there's this huge crowd. And they've all gathered around the door because they can't get in. And these men arrive. And I'd imagine, you know, I'm not sure if they had a particular time they were aiming for, but they probably felt like they were a bit too late. You know, the crowd's already there. They can't get through the door. Um, but they don't give up. Uh, they find a way to get to him. They get on the roof somehow. Um, and, they, and they dig through it. Um, when I first read that, I thought, how did they get him on the roof? You know, they're using a ladder and dragging him up the ladder somehow. Um, and then how do you dig through a roof? Uh, surely it's pretty hard to keep the rain out. Um, but I learned a little bit more about first century houses that was helpful for this. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, so this is an artist's depiction of what a house in first century Palestine might have been like. Um, but I found it very helpful. Uh, you can see this external stair. It kind of looks like the stairway to nowhere. Um, probably because we often build second stories on, on the houses that we build here. Uh, but what they like to use the space on the roof, uh, potentially to you know, have garden beds or, or to store things up there or to repair the roof, most likely that would be important as well. Um, and you might see on the side of the building these wooden things sticking out. They are the roof beams. So they would set these roof beams along the roof and they would cover them with these branches and rushes and then cover on top of that with dried mud to sort of seal it as best they could. So because it's made of dried mud and, mud and vegetation, you could actually dig through it. It would have been pretty hard, uh, but they would have been able to do it just with their hands. And from what I understand from my research, it wouldn't have been a dangerous thing for them to go up those stairs and stand on top. Uh, but as you start to break the roof, that might have created an element of danger. <laughs> you're making a hole essentially in what you're standing on. Um, also for the people inside, that would have been quite a distressing sort of feeling. What is that? There's things falling down on me. Um, who's up there? Uh, and particularly in today's society, whoever owned the house might have thought, who's wrecking my roof? Um, and the other part that I was thinking is that these people have come quite early to hear Jesus. You know, they're, they're sitting in the place of honour with all the crowd stuck outside. And these men have sort of skipped the queue in a sense. Um, but perhaps as they saw this paralysed man being lowered down, they would have thought, oh no, there's a, something important here that Jesus can do. Um, and I think these men know that this is not normal polite behaviour, to climb on someone's roof and dig through. But I think they have a real desperation to get to Jesus and to bring their friend. And they have such faith that Jesus actually says, it says Jesus saw their faith. 
he sees something in their actions and their attitude, and maybe through the Holy Spirit it revealed something as well. Um, he sees their courage uh, to take this step and do what others did not. I'm sure there were other sick people outside as well. Um, they had real persistence to overcome the obstacles in front of them. And, and they sacrificially acted. You know, they carried this man from wherever he'd come. They dug through the roof. They were lowering him in. And, and if this didn't go well, if they were told to you know, get out of here, stop wrecking the roof, it would have been really embarrassing for them. So they risked their social reputation as well. Um, so they might have had to take a you know, social hit because of that. And they were unified. They worked together. I can almost imagine after this experience, um, having heard the story, you'll know already that the man is healed and he's given uh, forgiveness for his sins, that these men might have high-fived afterwards, you know, been so encouraged by this experience. Um, and it's in response that Jesus sees their faith that he says these words, Son, your sins are forgiven. And the first time I heard that, I think I've heard it a lot when I was a child, but when I read it recently, I thought, that's not the script that was meant to happen from the people's point of view. They're lowering their friend down and they're expecting an amazing healing. They've got faith that Jesus can do that, but Jesus actually says something different. He says, your sins are forgiven. Um, we see shortly after this that he heals his body as well, but he focuses on something that no one else was focusing on, uh, the need for forgiveness. And that's his whole purpose. That's why he's there. Um, that's what he's teaching, their need for forgiveness, their need for repentance. Um, and he wants to show them who he truly is, that he has authority in this area as well. But I think we have an answer to our first question, and the, the next part of our passage will um, help us a bit more with this forgiveness idea. So the first question I had was, Jesus responds to the faith of this group by granting forgiveness of sins and healing. But what was so significant about their faith? Well, they were unified on their mission. They were persistent. They were sacrificial and genuinely believed Jesus could heal their friend. They had faith in Jesus. And Jesus actually proved to be you know, even more than they could have imagined. Not just someone who could heal their friend, but someone who could provide forgiveness. Uh, let's keep reading from verse 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. Um, in this moment, Jesus is signaling to everyone there that he's not just a simple person performing these healings. He's able to discern what people are thinking. Uh, that would have been really shocking to those uh, teachers of the law sitting there. Um, but I think they're confused because they, they know that only God can forgive sins, but Jesus is claiming that he can too. Um, in a sense, he's claiming to be equal with God and equal with God's authority. And, and he's, he does this interesting challenge here. He says, if you think I can't forgive sins by my words, watch what I can do with my words. I can bring complete healing to this man. Um, let's read what happens from verse 10. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. I love that the result of the miracle is, is praising God. Um, but something interesting to me is that Jesus chooses this moment, apart from all the other healings he's done, uh, to grant forgiveness of sins. Um, and I think he's able to do it through two methods. Uh, one that's not written in this passage, but we find it in John chapter 5, verse 22. It says, um, when Jesus is talking, The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. So Jesus actually understands that he's going to be the one that's going to decide the guilt of all people. Uh, he's going to be the one who is the judge. So if Jesus knows he's going to be the judge and he says, I'm going to give forgiveness... That's a pretty strong statement because he's going to be the one deciding if forgiveness is granted over here. Um, but it's not just a decision he's able to make. He knows that he has something to complete to ensure that forgiveness. He has an act um, that's coming up where he's going to die on the cross and save everyone. So he both knows he's going to be the judge and he's going to pay the price uh, for the sin of this man and for all of us. So I think we have the answer to our second question. What does Jesus reveal about himself to not just this group, 
but the whole crowd. He reveals that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins because he was given it by God. And forgiveness is going to be paid for by him. So you might have thought, I've I've raced through this passage. It's quite short. But um, something I want to now focus on is, is what can we learn from the faith of these men and apply in our own lives You see, I'm quite challenged by the collective way that these uh, men helped their friend. They were unified, persistent, sacrificial, um, and they had this incredible, encouraging experience of Jesus healing their friend and giving forgiveness. So my thought is, how can we be like these men? What can we learn and adopt into our own lives as a church? Well, one aspect that I think um, maybe is underutilized but is really powerful is the life groups in our church and how they are possible spaces that we can go on mission together. Um, of course, we have all our ministries and other spaces, but I think life groups is a, is a, is a different kind of space because you can have an opportunity to go deeper and, and learn what people are really dealing with and what they're working through and support each other and encourage each other much like the disciples were able to, and much like this group of friends were able to work together. Um, So on the next slide, uh, I'm going to go through some ideas here of how life groups can become something. uh, Now, this may be true of some of the life groups here at church, but it's certainly something we're trying to focus on in our young adults. Um, Life groups can become a space where mission is extended through the life group. It's a collective effort. But it takes a bit of time to get to that space, Uh, But it's certainly somewhere I think we all need to move. Um, Because if a life group was to meet for, you know, decades of time and learn the Bible really well and and grow really, really close, I think actually that's missing a key purpose of what God's called us to do. Um, Those are important things. But he's called us to, um, you know, go to all the nations, to bring people to faith, to bring people to Jesus, just like these men did. Um, So we need to find other purposes alongside those um, so the first thing I think we need to do, and I think we do this quite well here at Campbell, is we need to create a sense of family in the life group. Um, family because in a family, you can feel safe and, and trusted if it's a good, healthy family. Um, you have a sense of a foundation of love, uh, that people are there with you, and they're going um, to still be there in a little while. And the second thing is we need to collaborate. Um, we need to realize each other's strengths. Um, kind of like that body of Christ idea of of realizing that the gifts and abilities that people have and considering how we can work together. Um, And that requires you to value everyone equally. And and here's something I think um, is something that I want to introduce in the young adult space, and it might be something you, you have a really clear sense of in the life groups that you're part of, is to have a purpose that you all unify around. You all know why you're meeting together. Um... Because you may have different ideas, but when you have a unified purpose, you have a sense of direction of what you're doing together, why you're gathering. Um, And I think that's really foundational. If that's in place, then you can move forward from there. Uh, The third thing I think we need is to be humble. Because I think that humility allows us to share what's really going on. Um, It takes a bit of courage to admit when you have doubts, uh, when you're dealing with something that is making you feel shaky in your faith. Uh, Maybe it's a really big life event, something that's causing a lot of suffering, or or maybe you're just questioning something and you're challenged, and and you need to have a bit of humility to allow others to help you, to allow others into your deeper world. Um, I think that's really important because otherwise we could be pretending on the outside everything's fine and actually it's not. Also, humility allows us to rely on the Holy Spirit. Uh, which I think is uh, crucial uh, for any life group uh, to be guided. And and, um, I think this idea of discerning together that I just put up there as well is is something that I think, um, I guess, helps with that unifying purpose. You have a purpose of why you meet and you have a sense of of what God uniquely wants your group to focus on and to do. Um, So there's no kind of power and balance there if people are humble. Uh, obviously, this is something to aspire to, not something easily uh, obtained. And the fourth, um, which I think is probably the hardest, is we need to be sacrificial. Um, I think in today's society, particularly here in Melbourne, uh, we have a lot going on. 
We have a lot of, I guess, work pressures or, or family commitments or, or other community things we're part of that can pull us in different directions. And these can all be very good, important things. Uh, but I think if we find it a real challenge to be part of a life group or to be part of something the life group is doing, um, then maybe we need to consider what we might need to sacrifice in order to be able to achieve the mission that we're aiming to achieve. And that is tricky because time is vital. Time is what is on short supply here in Melbourne, I think. Uh, we're not so easygoing and relaxed in our life, although some of you here probably are. Um, I find this particularly challenging um, to consider that if, if we do want to do this together, if we want to reach out together, we might have to sacrifice um, you know, some comfort or some time or some energy um, and potentially reputation as well. Um, and lastly, I think we need to persist. Uh, it can be discouraging if we're seeking to reach out as a community, kind of like um, what I shared at the very start with the Nepal team, uh, where we had some Christian people gathering with some people who weren't Christian and just being together and just having life together actually enabled us to share our faith in ways that felt natural and just part of getting to know each other and, and sharing what was important in our lives. Um, but it can be discouraging if, if, if a person rejects you or pushes back at you. Um, I love what Abby shared about some people feeling like they're a stone wall. They're like, they're just not interested. Don't bring it up. Don't ever talk about it. Um, but from my own experience, uh, from praying for a friend for a very, very long time, who was like that, um, he wasn't always so like a wall there were spaces where he opened up and I was able to share. And um, He didn't come to faith, or he hasn't yet. Um, but I think that we can find ourselves discouraged if we don't persist. And I think this is a really powerful part about having a community that's um, having a singular purpose and moving together, is that you can encourage each other that this one setback isn't the whole picture. Um, we're all working on this together, and we can keep praying for those people and praying for each other. And I, I guess I have this sense in my heart that um, if we were able to do this, if all of our life groups um, were kind of focused on mission together, uh, then, these, then these life groups, I believe, would be like the early church. You know, they had this intense love for each other and God added to their number every day. Um, and it's not all about numbers, but I guess I have this sense of uh, giving more and more people the opportunity to uh, come to faith. And um, I'm hopeful uh, that just as these men were able to bring uh, their close friend to faith, as we consider going on mission together, we might be able to bring people that come into our community um, to see Jesus for themselves. Um, so this is the answer to my last question. Um, it's a very simple one. What can we learn from the faith of these men and apply in our own lives? Well, we can go on mission together, just as they did. Um, let me pray for us. Father God, um, we are, you know, clay pots. Uh, we are frail vessels. And it's you that fills us up and allows us to uh, not only be, be saved, but to have a purpose in this world. I pray that you would help us to gather around each other a collective purpose, that you would join us together in a unified sense of, of what we're doing, that your spirit would be leading us into the best ways of, of reaching out to people, and that we wouldn't be too proud to allow others to do it with us. Um, but we would see that sense of the collective effort uh, is your body of Christ shining as a city on a hill. So others can see and come to that space and encounter you for themselves. Uh, I pray that you would lead us through this. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.